Beneath the hundred foot deep waters of Lake Patricia in Canada lies a revolutionary secret that was once poised to change the tides of World War II. As essential materials for warfare manufacturing became scarce and limited, the Allies were forced to get creative and began looking for ways to produce new contraptions using natural materials. A genius inventor, who some even labeled as mad, eventually received the support of a military royal and Prime Minister Winston Churchill himself to build the unimaginable, an aircraft carrier made out of giant man-made icebergs. Prepare to be amazed. As it peaked in mid-1940 and through the end of 1943, the Battle of the Atlantic was the most extended military campaign in World War II. All over the North Atlantic, British fleets suffered heavy damage against the lethal German U-boats and Luftwaffe aircraft, which intercepted and sank them at an alarming rate. By the time Italy's Regia Marina introduced their own submarines into the mix, the Allies were already running out of resources needed to build naval equipment. Bombs and fighter aircraft proved efficient means to protect the vessels. However, they could not be deployed into the oceans without aircraft carriers, and these massive ships required significant amounts of steel to be manufactured, a material already in scarcity. In 1942, Geoffrey Pike, an eccentric scientist, inventor, and journalist, had an idea to protect Allied ships from the Nazi submarine's lethal weapons. He believed that a giant floating ice ship would be a great natural sourced option in the face of material limitations. The inventor's proposed solution was to build a carrier out of water, the most plentiful material on Earth. His suggestion included cutting off a large piece of ice from the Arctic, towing it into the ocean, and hollowing out the center. The inventor, working at one of the branches of the British War Office, then contacted the newly appointed Chief of Combined Operations, Lord Louis Mountbatten. The royal family member had already heard of Pike through one of his previous outrageous yet creative ideas. After selling him on his latest scheme, Mountbatten brought the inventor, along with his designs, to Winston Churchill. Visibly impressed, the Prime Minister gave the project his blessing. Habakkuk The project was codenamed Project Habakkuk to reference the biblical book of the same name. Regarded by many of his colleagues in the Combined Operations Office as a genius or even a lunatic, Pike was given leave to pursue his latest outrageous idea. The inventor then drew the plans for a giant aircraft carrier featuring an extended landing platform along the top with a central void running her length below. This empty space would serve as a shelter for the planes. The proposed ICE aircraft carrier was designed to be the largest machine ever built, 2,000 feet long, 200 feet wide, twice as big as the Titanic. With a weight of 2 million tons, enough space for 300 aircraft, and a top speed of 8 miles per hour, Churchill would now have the most impressive secret weapon against the lethal German U-boats. Her torpedo-proof hull made of ice would be 40 feet thick, equipped with 40 dual-barrel turret guns and numerous light anti-aircraft guns. And to ensure the carrier didn't melt during operations, Pike proposed a massive cooling system made out of a complex network of pipes that would constantly pump chilled refrigerant on the ice. Pikrete There were several problems with the ice during initial tests, as its brittle composition deformed under pressure. According to Pike, a ship as large as Habakkuk would likely sag under its own weight. By a mere stroke of luck, Two researchers from the Polytechnic Institute of Brooklyn had just made a significant breakthrough, discovering that wood pulp or sawdust mixed with water froze into a material tougher than concrete and 14 times stronger than regular ice. The researchers' experiments also showed that this innovative material was resistant to chipping, compression, and even bullets. The frozen, watery pulp would be machined like wood and cast into specific shapes like metal. When immersed in water, the material formed an insulating armor on its surface that protected its interiors from melting. The wondrous discovery was christened Pikrete in honor of Jeffrey Pike. The inventor then called molecular biologist, glacial expert, and eventual Nobel Prize winning protein chemist Max Peretz to join the project. Together, the duo perfected the functionality of Pikrete, determining that the ideal breakdown for structural soundness was 14% sawdust or wood pulp and 86% ice. 
Both men championed the prospective benefits of a full-scale carrier that could use seawater to repair damages while also discovering some of Pikecrete's inevitable challenges. Expansion during the freezing period made construction more difficult than Pike initially anticipated, as the ice and sawdust mixture would start bowing under its own weight at temperatures above 5 degrees Fahrenheit. However, Pike was satisfied enough to present the Pikecrete mixture to Lord Mountbatten, who was impressed and took a sample directly to Churchill. It is said that once, at Churchill's home in late 1942, Mountbatten found the Prime Minister taking a bath and dropped the block of Pikecrete into the water. Both men then stared at the slowly melting wood pulp. During the secretive Quebec conference in August of 1943, an enthusiastic Lord Mountbatten attempted to demonstrate Pikecrete's efficiency in front of several witnesses, including top military officials from America, Canada, and the United Kingdom. During the display, Lord Mountbatten presented two blocks one made of ice and the other of pikecrete. Then, without a single warning, the royal and military official pulled out his pistol and shot the block of ice, which shattered into pieces. He then turned his gun to the pikecrete and fired at it. This time, the bullet ricocheted off the frozen block and grazed the trouser leg of U.S. Navy Admiral Ernest King, ending up in the wall behind the stunned witnesses. The miraculous display was precisely what Pike needed to proceed with Project Habakkuk, and top Allied officials gave the go-ahead to design develop and build the aircraft carrier. According to estimations, each Habakkuk ship had a price tag of 700,000 pounds and would require 300,000 tons of wood pulp, 25,000 tons of fiberboard insulation, 35,000 tons of timber, and 10,000 tons of steel. Prototype Large amounts of ice were needed to build the aircraft carrier, and Pike turned to Canada's National Research Council for help. The man in charge, C.J. McKenzie, once called the Habakkuk Project a mad, wild scheme, but chose Lake Patricia in Alberta as the test site due to its closeness to a conscientious objectors camp where men did free labor instead of joining the military. The prototype would be a scale model weighing 1,000 tons and measuring 30 by 60 feet, and would be kept cold throughout the summer using a single horsepower motor designed to show off the technology under real-world conditions. The original goal of the scale model was to test how well Pikecrete held up against several different explosives and weapons, examine environmental durability, and troubleshoot the previously known issues. The model took eight men two weeks to complete, and according to onlookers, seemed to hold up well enough against both nature and man-made explosives. Upon its completion, Churchill ordered a full-scale vessel and gave it the highest priority. However, a full-sized Habakkuk was a tall order, and although completion was planned for mid-1944, engineers hit a snag almost immediately regarding the extensive supply list. As Pike and his team soon discovered, seasonally driven temperature changes made steel-based internal support necessary, requiring much more than estimated. Factoring in additional steel, already in high demand and low supply, would triple the initial proposed cost, raising it to 2.5 million pounds. In addition, the project was also met with creative and political snags, as the United Kingdom wanted to ensure that America was just as invested in the idea, and began to phase Pike out of the process. Never-ending problems By the summer of 1943, Habakkuk received significant criticism and observations, and the expectations were through the roof. With a planned 2,000-foot runway to accommodate the Royal Navy's heavy bomber aircraft and thick pikecrete walls to withstand German torpedoes, a single Habakkuk carrier would end up displacing no less than 2 million tons of water. Like steel, wood was also in short supply, and building merely one Habakkuk would immensely affect paper production. While the vessel was expected to have a 7,000-mile range and handle the highest waves in open sea, her colossal size brought unforeseen concerns about her speed and steering abilities. Then, as the project kept dragging on, its complexities and variables made it clear that the odds were stacked against Pike's dream. The final nail in the vessel's development was that the complexity of insulating and refrigerating such a large ship would have required time and manpower that none of the Allies could afford, as the fighting was not only taking place in the Atlantic, but in the rest of the world, too. The last meeting about Habakkuk's development then took place in December of 1943. By that point, the war had evolved in several key factors, with Portugal allowing the Allies to use their airfields and thus enabling them to deploy more of their airborne U-boat patrols over the Atlantic Ocean. In addition, the increased production of traditional aircraft carriers and the introduction of long-range fuel tanks that allowed for longer flight times over the ocean 
turned the Habakkuk into an obsolete concept before she even took shape. The remains of Habakkuk lie at the bottom of Patricia Lake in Alberta, where she proved her potential when it took three hot Canadian summers for the test vessel to completely melt. Thank you for watching our Dark Seas video. If you liked it, please give us a like, and don't forget to leave a comment below and subscribe to this and all the other channels from the Dark Documentaries family. Stay tuned for more.